Hey photographers! Today I'm answering your comments about the Fujifilm GFX 100S. Now, several of you wondered what would justify this purchase, so let me try to explain that. The answer might be very simple and as straightforward as the model number—100 megapixels. That is quite amazing resolution and detail, and it's a disruptive camera and certainly ups the stakes in the resolution and the sensor size game. The 100S is more than halfway from full frame to the larger than full frame models, but its price is much closer to full frame cameras. If you or your clients have a need for or can take advantage of higher resolution and quality than full frame delivers, here is the most affordable way to step up. Otherwise, there's no strategic, practical, or artistic reason, but the 100S does have a few other nice to have features, which I'll get to later. Now, if you've tried high resolution before, say 40 megapixels and up, that some full frame models offer, you'll know that getting excellent results isn't simple. Because while the 100S has the potential to improve your images, it isn't a silver bullet. It requires a better than average understanding of photography and a thoughtful approach to selecting settings. For the best results, you can't sit back and let the magic happen. You'll have to be an active participant. And that's who this camera is designed for. If you are not prepared to do that, or if you are not prepared to shoot with only the highest quality settings, if you are not investing an equivalent amount in computer power, graphics, and storage, you will get better results from a lesser camera, even if that lesser camera doesn't include nostalgic negative. <laughs> that said, I did find it easier to get impressive results here than I expected. This model seems well designed, and from an operational viewpoint, the design has been well implemented. Uh, thanks to the stabilization system, you won't need a tripod. Well, not for the 100 megapixel images anyway. If you plan to use the 400 megapixel pixel shift multi mode, you most definitely need one. And I would consider that a gimmicky feature that requires even more attention to detail and is only suitable for absolutely static scenes. Now, the GF lenses, this is the 32 to 64 mm f4, absolutely provide the results promised by the sensor. And just to finish my high level executive too long didn't watch summary, this camera works at a slower pace than you might be used to, particularly focus but also the shutter. Not annoyingly slow, but if you are considering the GFX 100S, there are some full frame cameras that you might also consider at half the price or less. The Sony a7R 4 or the Sigma FPL, 61 megapixels, the Canon 5DSR and Sony A1 at 50, the Nikon Z7 II and Canon R5 at 45. And then looking the other way, starting at about five times the price, the competition is Hasselblad and Phase 1 models offering 150 megapixels. That is not a league I play in. So the 100S is actually a very interesting intermediate position, particularly as its sensor is larger than full frame, but not quite as large as the Hasselblad and Phase 1. In this range, the 100S provides a cost effective dollar to megapixel ratio, $78 per megapixel. To consider image quality, there are two design considerations beyond the resolution. There's the actual size of the sensor, and then the size, the inner diameter of the lens called the throat. Both play a role in image quality. Full frame, which refers to the size of the frame used in 35mm still cameras, is a sensor size of 36mm by 24mm. If you're wondering why it's not called 36mm, 35mm actually refers to the width of the film, 
With the sprockets, the available image width is 24 millimeters. And why 3 by 2 aspect? It's theoretically based on the golden ratio and was used by painters long before Joe Niepce took the first photograph. The highest resolution Hasselblad and Phase 1 use a larger sensor, 53 by 40 millimeters. That's a 4 by 3 aspect. The sensor in the 100S falls between those two sizes at 44 by 33. That's also 4 by 3 aspect. Accordingly, on the 100S, the largest image, the one that delivers 102 megapixels, is 4 by 3. Selecting the more traditional 3 by 2 aspect option saves 90 megapixel files. Now, if you are waiting for me to say or explain medium format, I invite you to check out the Wikipedia reference. Now, a larger surface area enables either more or larger pixels. Larger pixels can absorb more light more quickly. And at the highest resolutions, each of these three sensor sizes are roughly similar in pixel size. The advantage goes to full-frame sensors with lower resolutions, which is why Sony's full-frame A7S III with 12 megapixels is such a low-light champ. Then, according to Wikipedia, of full-frame models, the largest throat is found on the latest mirrorless models. The largest, by a millimeter, is Nikon's 55mm Z-mount. The throat of the GF lenses is 65mm. For reference, X-mount is 49mm. And here's why that makes a difference. Yes, a larger opening lets in more light. But also, just as a larger aperture creates a shallower depth of field, a larger lens diameter enables a larger aperture, resulting in improved bokeh. That's noticeable from your first shot. The bokeh, here with the 80mm f1.7, is buttery smooth. What did I just say? Why do we use that expression? How smooth is butter? <laughs> One more thing, lenses. On a full-frame lens, a uh, full-frame sensor, a 50 millimeter lens has an angle of view of about 47 degrees. A GF 50 millimeter has a wider 57 degree field of view, the same as a 40 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. The GF 63 millimeter lens provides the visual equivalent of a full frame 50 millimeter lens. It's kind of a reverse crop, 0.8. And even though the selection is somewhat limited in these early days for GF lenses, the quality is beyond reproach. Size, weight, operation, these meet a high standard. Also, not cheap. Well, hopefully that wasn't too photo geeky, because we're trying to determine the benefits that higher resolution, a bigger sensor, and a larger throat play in your images. And these all play to the aesthetic allure of a larger than full frame sensor. I'm not sure how to describe this. It's like the warmth of vinyl records. There's just something here that adds a sense of presence, a you didn't know what you were missing until you saw it sensation. But this is YouTube, so honestly, even if you're watching in 4K, which is the equivalent of 8 megapixels, no YouTube video can possibly do justice to these images, nor even provide you with the ability to see the difference between an APS-C full frame or GFX 100S image. My sample images are on Flickr, and I hope that helps. What I can do here is zoom in to an 8 megapixel selection of the image. So each image pixel is mapped to a pixel on a 4K screen. That somehow feels like an overly analytical look that takes you from the whole image, like standing up too close to a painting. But if you are planning to crop 8 megapixel images from these 100 megapixel files, this is what you can expect. And as every photographer who's taken images over 40 megapixels knows, you cannot get good results from casual snaps. Even the slightest movement during the exposure will blur the image. Based on my experience with other high resolution models, I thought I would start to see blur at durations under 1 over 125. But I managed to handhold down to one quarter of a second before a little bit of smearing crept in. Fujifilm's new stabilization engine is very good. However, 
Focus is a little slower than what I'm used to and often takes multiple attempts to achieve focus at the closest distance. It will have you reconsider manual focus mode and taking more care. And I know that some of you will be frustrated while the rest welcome the added precision and relish perfection. Now, I'm still working out a solid exposure and focus workflow. I do plan to share that in an upcoming video. Now, after all that, the results are more than pleasing. I've taken all of these scenes before, but now looking at these images is a little like the first time. There are other improvements and upgrades. Many of you are more excited than I am for Nostalgic Negative, the latest addition to the film simulation menu. I'm pretty confident it will appear on other models going forward. And I'm actually a little meh on this one, preferring the slightly more natural old school classic negative. But between the ability to bracket three film sims or to change them in playback mode, chacun son goût, as they say in La Belle Provence. The main menu, maybe thanks to the quad-core processor, is responsive, and after years of requesting, it reopens to the last access setting. It's straightforward and reasonably well organized. Transitions between screens are more consistent than ever, and the annoying crop of the menu over HDMI in video mode has also been addressed. Now, they can move on to adding the setup features to the My Menu options. Most Fujifilm models don't have the dual screen manual focus option. The 100S does, along with four other manual focus assists. The six custom settings now include the exposure mode, shutter, aperture, and drive mode settings, and all of the color recipe settings, tone curves, white balance shift, also all included along with the ability to recall them from the mode dial and then change them on the fly. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say six? Twelve! Six for stills, six more for independent custom settings for video. These are the most useful and usable custom settings on any camera model. Uh, now, none of these are killer features. Sorry, we call them game changers now. But uh, they do add value to the overall package. Touch select focus area and focus are available, but not tap and snap. I'm sure that won't be missed here. Also, gratefully, I note that the gimmicky and unnecessary advanced filters, the sports mode, as well as pre-shot have been retired, along with panorama mode. Multi-exposure remains, as does the interval timer and focus bracket. Now, many of you are annoyed because there's no battery charger included. The appropriate USB cable and power adapter are, and as the camera can be USB powered, I have no issue with that. Packing a cable instead of a charger and its power plug are an improvement in my practice. So is there a bottom line here? Are there equally capable cameras who provide identical results for the same investment? Well, for video, the answer is easily yes. That doesn't make the GFX 100S any less capable as a video camera, but there are other cameras that output 4K RAW for less. Uh, but I'm already anticipating that the release that there will be a release of GFX Cine lenses, and that the next version of this camera with an even better processor will support a higher video resolution. That will be something. So who's this camera for? Well, possibly for you. If photography is your passion and full-frame high-resolution work inspires your creativity, then the GFX 100S is likely the next step. I was very intrigued by the number of viewers who commented that they already have one or have one on order. Uh, Fujifilm's approach to camera operation, along with the best selection of in-camera color profiles, can fulfill your creative potential. And then the very picky painstaking tethered studio photographers who fuss over every detail, I'm certain they will be pleased, but it would be a budget choice. They'll continue to lust after phase one in Hasselblad. Will this camera be a success? Well, I'm seeing some positive indicators. At B&H Photo, it's flagged as a number one seller. 
My friend, who manages a commercial photo studio, says client shoots have already shown up with the 100S in a tethered configuration for studio portraits for a large Canadian retailer. Good signs. So finally, Unstanic provided an unsettling thought. Should you be worried about theft if you're carrying around such an expensive camera? Would insurance cover the loss? And what do you do when someone stops you and tells you to hand over the camera? Hand over 10 grand? Wow, deep moral dilemmas. So here's some dad advice. Clearly, it is wise to be prudent. Visiting areas where the rule of law is not well respected and where your wealth makes you an obvious target, anything from your clothing to your phone, but especially an expensive camera, may put not only your possessions, but your life in danger. Be prudent. Uh, insurance covers what you want it to cover. Talk to your insurance agent. And don't assume that travel incidents or expensive things are covered. Well, once you have that peace of mind, don't risk your life over your possessions. Hand over the 10 grand. I hope that helps. But really, if these are thoughts in your head, You'll sleep easier if you travel with a smaller, lighter, and less conspicuous camera. Now, because this detail will give some of you great satisfaction, this camera and the lenses are made in Japan. Last thing, I do want to thank all of those of you who commented that they would watch my review even if they had no intention of buying this camera. That's so kind. It's very encouraging to know that. Now, I'm anxious to get back to creating some images and recording some video. That's it for now. As always, happy to have your relevant questions and civil comments. And as I said at the beginning, I'm not sponsored. Fujifilm doesn't get to review my scripts or the video before I post, and my videos aren't interrupted by ads. Those decisions make this a better channel, but there's a financial impact. And those of you who support this channel as members have my most sincere thanks. If membership is for you, please use the join button below or subscribe. <laughs> that remains your free option to access all my content. <laughs> thanks for watching. Stay safe.